We're going to chapter 2 tonight, which I think is one of the two spiritual highlights of the first epistle of Corinthians, the other one being chapters 12 to 14. And both of these sit on the opposite side of the scales in the, the um, outline that we gave you a couple of weeks ago, where we gave you the, um, the structure for Corinthians, both first and second Corinthians. And in that structure, chapter two was on the opposite side of the introversion that 12 to 14 was on. And both of these sections deal with spiritual matters or spiritual things. And it's both of these are sort of the highlight, I believe, spiritually in the book of Corinthians because after this, and we get into all the problems that they had, but if they would just have focused upon the wisdom of God that's in these two sections, they would have been walking like Reverend Martindale was talking a while ago, always speaking in tongues, always ready to interpret and prophesy, and always ready to receive revelation. And that's why I think what he said was very apropos to what we're getting into here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Last week we saw in chapter 1 that the wisdom of God far surpasses the wisdom of men. And the wisdom of God is defined in chapter 1 as the righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And along with that and the power of God, those are all the things that God has made known to us. And the wisdom of God is wrapped up, first of all, in the cross of Christ that Paul preached. And that cross represented Christ's death, which represented everything that he accomplished by that death. And the things that he accomplished by that death and his resurrection was righteousness, sanctification, redemption, the wisdom of God, the power of God, all those things. And now he starts a new section, which begins with, and I, brethren, in chapter 2. And each of these sections in Corinthians starts with a flag like that, like chapter 3, and I, brethren, starts out the same way. Chapter 5 starts out, it is reported commonly. He gets into something that was reported. And you know chapter 7 starts with, now concerning the things that you wrote about. So each one has a flag that begins these new sections. And here he starts out, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the mystery, or the, it says testimony in King James of God, but the word is mystery in both the Aramaic as well as a number of Greek texts. And it should be mystery because that is the great, key to this whole section, this whole chapter, is the mystery of God. Because prior to this, he's defined wisdom in what he had taught the Corinthians the first time, which was Jesus Christ and him crucified and all that that crucifixion represented. But now there's more to wisdom than that. And that's what he wants to take him into in this chapter. That's why it should be the word mystery rather than testimony or witnesses many of the greek texts have the aramaic as well as some of the greek texts have greek manuscripts have the word mystery and that's what it should be furthermore that word excellency the greek word was used of a professional teacher his superiority that he had as a professional teacher or a rhetorician or a philosopher, or a rabbi. You might call them the PhDs of their time. They were the tops in their field. The only other occurrence of this particular Greek word is in 1 Timothy 2.2 2, where it says that we should pray for kings and all that are in what? Authority. All that are in authority. That word authority is this word, excellency. It deals with those who, who are in an authoritative position as superior professional teachers, rhetoricians, rabbis, philosophers, the PhDs in their field. Today we have PhDs in perhaps other fields, but some of these fields are represented as well. And we're to pray not just for the kings, the government officials, 
but all that are in authority, those who hold prominence in the world from the world's standpoint. Why? That we can lead a quiet and peaceable life. But Paul says, I didn't come to you with this authoritarian type of speech, logos, or of wisdom, Sophia, excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the mystery of God. In verse 7, it says, but we speak the uh, wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. He adds here that this wisdom that he began in chapter 1 now has a further dimension to it. It has a, an even greater aspect than he taught the Corinthians the first time he was there. The first time all he taught was Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But now he's coming back and he says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So there's more to the wisdom of God than just Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Keep your finger here and look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And it tells us a little more about this wisdom. Because Ephesians, you remember, is where the mystery was revealed in all of its fullness. Before this, remember Paul had been at Ephesus for some three years. And so when he writes back to the Ephesians, he's writing a doctrinal epistle, so he could not have taught them that information while he was there, at least not in all of its fullness, perhaps part of it. And this... You know, Paul didn't know it all at once. It was revealed to him gradually, sort of like <clears throat> things today. Dr. Werwell didn't know all these things back in 1942 that he teaches today, but by 1953 he was able to teach the first class on Power for Abundant Living, which, has, which had all the basic truths that are still in that class, but he's, God still continued to unfold the great truths of God's Word. And that's what we call progressive revelation, where it's progressively revealed. And Paul, same way, did not know the mystery in its fullness when he was at Ephesus, but God started sharing some things with him. And then gradually, by the time he got to Rome, he knew the fullness of that mystery and was able to write back to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8. That's why he could say here, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. God abounded toward us in all wisdom. Didn't just give us a little bit of it. Didn't just give us Jesus Christ and him crucified and all that wonderful stuff. He gave us even more. He abounded toward us in all wisdom. And then in chapter 3, right in this section on the mystery of chapter 3, and in verse 10, to the intent, that now under the principalities and powers in the heavenlies might be made known by the church the manifold what? Wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God. The multicolored wisdom of God in all of its aspects. God's revealed that to us that we might make it known in the heavenlies. We can make known not just a part of it, but all the wisdom of God, or the manifold wisdom of God. Now back to Corinthians. Verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Not talking about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He had taught that to them before. But he's talking about wisdom among them that are perfect. And this word perfect in Aramaic is gamir, G-M-I-R. Gamir, of course, is the word used. It's the word approved in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved. It's the word in, in um, 2 Timothy 3.17 that the man of God may be perfect, truly perfected. And in Romans 12.2 where... Uh, as you renew your mind, you show yourself, you prove what is that good and acceptable and what? Perfect will of God. The perfect will. Because 
This word in Aramaic, gamir, is used of the perfect or the mature, that which is completed. It's a more general term than the Greek word used here. But it's interesting that the, the Greek word chosen in this particular place was not artios or one of the other words that means perfect, but it's the word teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S, teleos. And teleos can mean of full age or mature or fully initiated. In Greek philosophy, the word was used of a man when he had achieved insight into philosophical knowledge. In the mystery religions, and that's something they were into at Corinth, you recall, the mystery religions, teleos referred to a person who was fully in initiated in the mystic rites. Someone who was of the 33rd degree or whatever. This verse does not refer to a higher or lower wisdom in Christianity like in, in the mystic religions, but it makes a difference between the mature and the immature believers. And that's why it uses this word fully initiated as being a mature believer as opposed to an immature believer. Because down in chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babies in Christ. Because the Corinthians were still babies. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Now look at it. Neither yet now are ye what? So he couldn't share the greatness of the mystery before because they were not fully initiated. They were not mature. They were still babies in Christ. Neither yet now are ye able. They still had not come to the point of full maturity. They still were not at the place where they could receive the great revelation of the mystery. Paul couldn't share it with them. But yet he's telling them about it. You can read all through the book of Corinthians. You'll never see Paul say that the Jew and Gentiles fell out of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You'll never read that in Corinthians. You'll only hear him talk about it. Because they were still babies. They were not mature. They were not the fully initiated. Now, back to verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, mature, fully initiated, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world or age, those words world or age, that come to naught. And the word come to naught in both the Greek and Aramaic means to be made without a job, <laughs> to cease work or to be made unemployed. Then in verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. Now you can see even and wisdom there are in italics. As a matter of fact, I think the best translation of this verse is we speak the hidden wisdom of God regarding the mystery. And the reason for that is because it's no longer a mystery because it's been what? revealed and if something is revealed it ceases to be the mystery but in the mystery religions their concept of a mystery was even after you you're initiated and you know what's going on you still don't know what's going on it's still a mystery see nobody can understand it sounds like some three-in-one thing that we've talked about before see the hidden wisdom of god the reason it was hidden, it was hidden before the day of Pentecost, well, before it was revealed to the Apostle Paul. It was a mystery then. Nobody knew about it. Not the Judeans, not the Gentiles. Nobody knew, but 
after the day of Pentecost. It was available to be known, but nobody rose up to really believe it until the Apostle Paul came along. It's that hidden wisdom regarding the mystery which God ordained or predestinated before the world unto our glory. And by the way, that word glory is not the same as the word boast in 131. The word glory in 131 and in 129 was boast. This is the word glory, which means brilliance. To our brilliance, our brightness, our glory. Now, how does this mystery differ from that of the mystery religions? And of course, the mystery religions were, were very common in Greece. They had a number of them that had been brought in by Alexander the Great's movement around the world and his contact with many others. And so, both in the Greek communities as well as the Oriental communities that had settled in Greece, they had a number of these mystery religions, and the details of what they believed were known only to the fully initiated, the teleos. And they were under a strict oath in jeopardy of losing their salvation if they disclosed these secrets. Not true of the great mystery. You tell everybody about it. <laughs> you better. For example, the illusion mystery religion was known throughout the world because it originated near and was promoted by the city of Athens. Their mode of initiated, initiation involved baptism, sound familiar, in which they thought to be reborn. However, little is known about their central rite because it was only known to the initiates. Another one was the worship of Dionysus which was a little more radical because the um, worshipers would, would uh, in a naked, drunken frenzy, run through the woods. And coming upon an animal, they would tear it asunder with their bare hands and eat the raw flesh and drink the blood. And by this, they were thought to partake of the actual flesh and blood of the god and thereby acquired the spirit of that particular God, which they undoubtedly did. <laughs> now, there's four very interesting things about these mysteries in the so-called mystery religions. Number one, in initiation, while being baptized, the worshiper somehow died and rose again even though these things were not perceptible. He would somehow die and rise again in his baptism, whether it was water baptism, blood baptism, or whatever it was. Number two, the God, whoever the God was in that religion, and the son of that God, and the spirit living in the mother of the God, were somehow one and the same. Sound familiar? Number three, those who died were somehow still alive. Sound familiar? And number four, you could partake of the flesh and blood of the God and gain his life. Now, in this light of these four things, there is no likeness between the great mystery of Christianity and the mysteries of the pagan religions. But because of syncretism, syncretism, S-Y-N-C-R-E-T-I-S-M, which is what I talked about in the background of Corinthians as the combining of ideas and doctrines from different religions to form your own religion. That's syncretism. And so when Christianity came in, they combined with certain other pagan concepts. And because they did that, the doctrine of the mystery religions, doctrines of the mystery religions, crept into the church. And so by the 4th century, and probably a lot sooner than that, the doctrines of the Babylon mysteries 
stood intact with Orthodox Christianity. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit were said to be one. The dead were believed to be alive, and somehow one mysteriously died and rose again while he was being baptized. And in communion, the bread and wine mysteriously became the actual body and blood of the Lord. All of these things were referred to as sacraments, which comes from the Latin word sacramentum, which means mystery. The central essence of the difference between the genuine and counterfeit mysteries is that the genuine Christian mystery was a secret because it was hidden prior to its revelation. But once the great mystery was revealed, it's no longer hidden. But in the mystery religions, they were still hidden even after you knew or supposedly knew what they were. The Christian mystery was to be known to all. The pagan mysteries were kept secret. The knowledge of the genuine mystery was to cause believers to be strong. The counterfeit mysteries were so far above man that they were unreachable. Therefore, the pagans actually were worshiping gibberish. The knowledge of the genuine mystery is understandable, and its magnitude is not in how high it is above man, but how unsearchably great it is to man. So what is happening here in 2 Corinthians is God is not only showing how foolish the worldly wisdom is, but how much, how much superior the wisdom of God is, even the wisdom concerning the mystery. That's why I said the wisdom regarding the mystery would be a much better translation than the wisdom in a mystery, because that's what the religions did. They taught wisdom in a mystery, that their wisdom was mysterious. But it's the wisdom of God which was hidden concerning this great mystery which is now revealed. That's the difference between the great mystery and the pagan mysteries. And the princes of this world didn't know about it. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Not only were the princes of the world ignorant of Christ in you, and that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promises, but also they were ignorant of the wisdom or application of these truths. Wisdom is knowledge applied. Everywhere a believer would be, who's there? Christ. Christ is in him. It's practice, in practical application. See? Everywhere a believer goes, you've got Christ in you. It's not just that you've got him inside, but where you go, he's with you. He's hands behind your hands, feet behind your feet, head behind your head, and all the rest of your system. That's the mystery, the hidden mystery or the hidden wisdom regarding the mystery that is now being made known that this whole chapter is about. Back to chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the mystery of God. Two ideas in that verse are negated. First of all, he didn't come to him with excellency of speech or of wisdom. And secondly, he didn't declare the mystery because they were still babies in Christ. They had not matured. They had not grown up. So he could only teach to them Christ crucified and the accomplishments of it. That's why chapter 1, verse 30 is so tremendous. That's as far as he could take them, what Christ accomplished for him. But he couldn't tell them the fullness of the wisdom that was available. And that's the mystery. And he still couldn't because there's still babies. That's why verse 2, 
says, for I determined not to, determined not to know anything among you. Save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The word know is, of course, oida, to perceive. But this phrase, to know anything, is a phrase in the Greek which is idiomatically used to mean a know-something. Sort of like a know-it-all, only not in the derogatory sense that we think of a know-it-all. But it's like an expert in the field. A professional who supposedly knows something. And he says, I determine not to be an expert in anything among you, except in one category, what? Jesus Christ and him crucified and everything that that accomplished. I determined, here the research team came up with this, I did not decide to be an expert among you except in one category, Jesus Christ and this very one crucified and all which that crucifixion represents. That's the only thing he could tell him. He couldn't tell him about the mystery. They were still babies, not big enough to receive it, not mature, not the fully initiated. Verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> but the words in weakness are not in the Aramaic. And I don't think they belong here because it just doesn't fit with Acts 18 where Paul went to Corinth. For a year and a half he stayed there. If you want to talk about weakness, maybe we ought to talk about Thessalonica. Or how about back at Philippi where he spent some time in jail? Or about the time he was was um, what are you, stoned. Those would be times of weakness. Here, when he was at Corinth, boy, nobody resisted him. When God said, stand, Paul. He says, nobody's going to touch you. And nobody did touch Paul when he was at Corinth. For a year and a half, somebody tried to and they beat him. But he says, I'm with you in weakness. It can't, it can't fit there. I think the Greeks might have adopted it to the text, a forgery, because of where Paul talks about uh, his weaknesses in 2 Corinthians so much. Uh, but it's in a whole different context, a whole different light. It just doesn't fit here. And another reason is they didn't understand the idiom, fear and trembling. Fear and trembling is, an, is a Hebrew idiom meaning respect and obedience. Respect and obedience. You know, you, you've read in the Word about the fear of God. That's respect of God, not fear. You don't have to be afraid of Him unless you're doing something wrong. It's respect of God. But trembling is also used of obedience. Because if you're not obedient, then you have a reason to tremble. See, But it's that idiom. Respect and obedience. And it's used of a servant or slave in the East. Fits real nicely with demonstration of the spirit and power of verse 4. See, how could he be there in fear and trembling and at the same time demonstrating the spirit and power? Doesn't make any sense. No, it's respect and obedience. Because the slave in the East, he always stood with his eyes glued to his master waiting for an eye signal or a hand signal. Look at Psalm 123. Psalm 123, verse 2. Behold, as the eyes of, of, of servants look unto the hand of their masters. Why do the eyes of servants look to their hands of their masters? They're waiting for a signal. You have a banquet. You have a hostess. Here at the head table, you have a hostess. The hostess should be watching the host. I mean, you know, the hostess should be watching the person at the table that's running the table so that when they want something, they can jump right in. But if they're not watching, they miss the signals. Okay? Okay? Eyes of the servants look to the hands of the masters. 
and the eyes of the maiden under the hand of her mistress. They're waiting for those signals. The respect is in watching, being watchful, and the obedience then is in carrying out whatever that signal commanded. That's the the, the slave of the East, and that's that idiom that's used back here in Corinthians. But we don't keep our eyes on a, a human master. We keep our eyes on whom? What did Reverend Martindale tell you a little bit ago about revelation? What did Dr. Weir will tell you about being sharp on these things? And we keep believing. We don't let Satan get at us. Keep working the word. If we're going to be sharp in revelation, keeping our eyes on God, we've got to speak in tongues much. We've got to be ready and, and ready and willing to interpret or prophesy. Then there's going to be revelation. But you've got to be keeping your eyes on whom? Not man. That's when revelation comes. So you stay your, your eyes upon God. The stayed mind. Remember stayed mind in Isaiah 26.3? You stay your mind on God. God's going to be ready to give it to you. In Philippians 2.12, it talks about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. It means work out your wholeness with respect and obedience. Looking to God. And when God tells you to do something, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, what do you do? Act obediently. Respect and obedience. That's this word, this phrase. Ephesians 6, 5, it says, Masters, be obedient to your, or servants, be obedient to your masters. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, keeping your eyes upon him. And you've got the same thing in Colossians 3, 22 to 24. And that's what this one is here in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 3. I was with you in respect and obedience, walking by the Spirit of God. How do I know that? Because verse 4 says, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of what? Spirit and of power. That's walking by revelation. That's not walking in fear, walking shaken in your boots, but it's walking with respect and obedience by revelation. Now in verse 4, the word man's is not in the Aramaic and it's not in some of the Greek manuscripts and I believe it should be left out. should just read, not with enticing words of wisdom. He didn't use the persuading, enticing words that the philosophers and rhetoricians used, but he used what? Demonstration of the Spirit and power. He walked. He used the nine manifestations of the Spirit. What did I tell you is the parallel section to this? 12 to 14. What does 12 talk about? The nine manifestations. Also talks about one body, being members in one body, and how those manifestations work in that one body. Then in chapter 13, how it's used most efficaciously with love. In chapter 14, how to work it in the church, which is the body. Demonstration of the Spirit. Isn't this hot? Terrific. Demonstration. The Greek word that's used here is used of a visible sign, a deed, something, not just words. Not theological reasoning, but visible courtroom type evidence where you've got proof. The proof of the demonstration of the Spirit would be the signs, miracles, and wonders that what? Follow. When signs, miracles, and wonders follow, you know there's proof. That's demonstration. It's not just talking about it. It's not theological jargon or a bunch of hot air. It's demonstration. That's the word that's used there. Maybe I better give you that Greek word. A-P-O. D-E-I-X-I-S. Apodexis. You can check any of these Greek words out in a lexicon or concordance or something, but most of them I'll just tell you what they mean, and you can work it further yourself, okay? 
but that's a neat word. It's demonstration, actual visible proof, not just hot air words of the spirit and dunamis power that your believing should not stand in the wisdom of men, a lot of words, but in the dunamis of God, the power of God. And that power has to be demonstrated, which means put into manifestation then. How be it? In spite of the fact that I came the first time and I demonstrated the Spirit, I didn't tell you everything about it. We still have to speak about another aspect of wisdom. We speak wisdom, wisdom, but we can only speak it among those who are mature, fully initiated. But it's not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of the world, that are come to naught or made unemployed, which they are by this wisdom of the mystery. They're totally out of work, but they're still working. But we speak the wisdom of God, the hidden wisdom of God regarding the mystery which God ordained before the age unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Has he told them what the mystery is? He's only told them it was so great that if they'd have known about it, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus Christ. But yet, you can only speak this wisdom to the mature, not to babies. This section is so big spiritually because this is what he really wanted to get to, but he couldn't because they were still babies. They were still carnal. They were still hanging on to other things, divisions, envy, strife, idols, things connected with idolatry. Still, who's the better leader? Apollos, Paul, Cephas? But this is what he really wanted to get to, but he couldn't until he wrote Ephesians. None of the princes of this world knew it, for had they known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9. But, as it is written, and whenever you have something that was written, that you're quoting here, it's a gnome, G-N-O-M-E, the figure of speech. It's a citation. And the quotation is, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. By the way, heart of man would be the um, seat of the personal life of that man because it's contrasted with what follows here of the man who has the Spirit of God. Things are a little bit different. This is quoted from Isaiah, chapter 64. We'll turn to it. Isaiah 64, <clears throat> and in verse 4 is where it's quoted. But we're going to start a few verses before that. Isaiah 64. Go back to 63, verse 17. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err? It should be allowed us. It's that idiom of permission. Why hast thou allowed us to err from thy ways and harden our heart from thy fear? Return for thy servants' sakes the tribes of thine inheritance. Lord, you know, we've blown it, but take us back. The people of thy holiness have only possessed this land a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. We are thine. Thou, you know, who did God rule over? Them, over Israel, right? But thou never bearest rule over them, the Gentiles that trod it down. 
They were not called by thy name, like Israel was. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thy adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. For God's people that wait upon him, that are anticipating him, that have their hope in him, God has something prepared. And the Gentiles didn't know anything about it, but neither did the Judeans. I have not seen nor ear heard. Verse 5, Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. In those is con continuance, and we shall be saved. We know we're going to be delivered, saved. This is the brief context of it here in Isaiah. But it's the Gentiles there who had trodden down Israel because Israel was out of fellowship. But Israel, there were still some in Israel who had their hope, who waited upon God. But nobody could see what they hoped for. No one could see what gave them that hope. I have not seen nor ear heard. So when this is applied to here, it's quoted and applied to this particular context in Corinthians. The context is the mystery. And nobody in the Old Testament, neither Judean nor Gentile, ever saw the things which God prepared for them that love him. What things? The things regarding the mystery. See? The things regarding the mystery. That's how this is applied here. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things of the mystery which God hath prepared for them that love him. Nobody has ever seen it before. But now... Everybody can see it that wants to. But all throughout the rest of this, wherever you see the word things, it's referring to the things of the mystery. Verse 10, but God hath revealed them. Them what? The things of the mystery unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things of the mystery. Yea, the deep things of the mystery of God. For what man knoweth the things of the mystery of a man? Each man has little mysteries in his hearts, his secret life, things he has never divulged to anyone else. I think Dave Bedard talked about that last week one day. But things in a person's heart and things perhaps you'll never reveal to anyone else. You never really know what's in a man's heart. That's why you don't know why he does some of the things that he does or she does some of the things that she does. You don't know that person's heart because you've never been in their shoes. And every person's different. That's why no what man knoweth the things, the mysterious things of that particular man save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of the mystery of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things, what things, of the mystery of that are freely given to us of God. Has he told them what it is? And he never will. Because there's still 
babies. But he's telling them how great it is and how readily available it is because you've got the Spirit of God. Which things of the mystery we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things of the mystery with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the mystery of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know those things of the mystery, because they are spiritually discerned. Who in the world, natural man, body and soul, can understand the things of the mystery? But he that is spiritual judges all things of the mystery, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now I'll go back up to verse 10. God hath revealed those things of the mystery unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things of the mystery. The word search is a word you should be familiar with in Greek. It's E-R-E-U-N-A long O. Erunao. It's the word that means to trace minutely or to track as a hunting dog sniffs out the prey. This is the word that's used in John 5.39 where it says, search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. What do we do in research? We search and search and search the scriptures, right? It's the same word that's used in 1 Peter 1.11 where it says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit which was upon them did signify of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. But what's omitted there? The mystery. The mystery's in that comma. It's not there. They could not search for the mystery. They could only search the sufferings, search the glory that followed, but they could not Search the mystery. There's only one way to search the things of the mystery, and that's with the Spirit of God within you. In Romans 11, you have this tremendous section that's not addressed to the church. Verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches of both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Well, what's part of his wisdom? The mystery. How untrackable, unsearchable is untrackable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Then it has, who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? The same verse quoted in chapter 2 of, of 1 Corinthians verse 16. Because the Gentile, and the Jew, to whom this section of Romans is addressed, you know, chapters 9, 10, and 11, Jew and Gentile in there. In that section, that's what he closes out with. Who has known the mind of the Lord? His ways are untrackable to the Judean and the Gentile. But when it comes to being born again of God's Spirit, you've got the Spirit in you. You've got a new lever. The Spirit searches all things of the mystery. In Ephesians chapter 3, Again, in this great section on the mystery. Verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable, untrackable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the administration of the mystery. Now look. It's the untrackable riches of Christ. And I could not see, ear could not hear, heart of man couldn't know it. But the Spirit searches all things. 
of the mystery. Here he says to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable, untrackable riches, the things that couldn't be tracked, yet he's out here preaching it. Because when you're tapped in, you've got the Spirit, you can walk by the nine manifestations. You can search, search, track like a dog. Sniff it out, the mystery. While you're there in Ephesians, look at 3.18. That we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the what? Four dimensions. In the Old Testament, they only spoke of three dimensions. Length, breadth, and height. Never the depth. There was never depth that they could really see. In Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 10, he says, The Spirit searches, tracks it like a dog. All things in the mystery, yea, the what? Deep things. It can get down in the deep, not just length, breadth, and height, but it can get to the depth, the deep things of the mystery of God. But when you don't have the Spirit, you have a little trouble apprehending what it's all about. What a verse. God hath revealed the things of the mystery unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things of the mystery. It tracks it down. Yea, even the deep things of the mystery of God. Dr. Werwell translates this verse, Yet God has revealed the things of the mystery which God hath prepared for them that love Him unto us through the Spirit, the gift. For the Spirit, the gift, traces minutely to uncover all things of the mystery. Yes, God's deepest secret things of the mystery. I'll let you listen to the tape and copy it down, or maybe we'll get copies of it made, okay? But isn't that tremendous? Listen to it again. Yet God has revealed the things of the mystery, which God hath prepared for them that love him unto us through the Spirit, the gift, for the Spirit, the gift, whose is the gift? Ours. That gift of Spirit traces minutely to uncover all things of the mystery. Yes, God's deepest secret things of the mystery. That's what you can do by the Spirit. Verse 11. For what man knows, perceives, oida, the things of a man, and it's those personal mysteries that a man has. This is an analogy. Can you really know what's in somebody else's heart and mind? No. Every person has those little secret things in their lockbox. Except the spirit of man which is in him. Reminds me of a man that died at a rather young age. And I think this was the first time this verse really became living to me. I wondered why a man would die at such of age, such an age. And Dr. Werwell told me some things about his life that only he knew. His wife didn't know it. Nobody else knew it. Well, he didn't really tell me what it was. He just told me that there were things in his life that only this man knew. And that's when this verse came alive. And in every person's life, there's things like that. Things I don't know about you. You don't know about me. See, we don't know what's in each other's hearts. But boy, we keep believing for each other. We keep praying for each other. We keep believing to see that things don't have it happen so the adversary doesn't trick us. Even so, the things of the mystery of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Only God knows those things until he reveals them. And in the first century, he revealed the great things of the mystery. But they weren't ready to receive it. They were still babies. Verse 12. Now we receive 
not the spirit of the world. All right, verse 11. I want to give you Dr. Werewolf's literal according to usage of this. He worked this some time ago, and these things are tremendous. Verse 11. For who of men knows the deep things of the mysteries of a man except the spirit of man, the man within himself, which is in him? Even so, the deep things of the mystery of God knows no man except the Spirit of God. Verse 12, Now we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Spirit of the world is usage aid in the Holy Spirit book, The Seed of the Serpent. Those who are born of the wrong seed. And spirit which is of God is the new birth. Usage 2a. See, we didn't receive the wrong birth. We received the right birth. The spirit which is of God. That we might know the things of the mystery that are freely given to us of God. His literal translation of that word verse, and by the way, the word received is Lombano is as follows. Nevertheless, we received Lombano, not the spirit of the world, Satan's seed, but we received the spirit which is from God to the end that we should know, perceive the things of the mystery that are freely given to us by God. Verse 13. Which things, the things that are freely given to us by God of the mystery, which things of the mystery also we speak. Hey, the pagan mysteries you weren't allowed to talk about. You didn't even know much about them, let alone talk about them. But it says, the things of the mystery also we do what? Open your mouth and let her roll. <laughs> Speak it. Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. The word holy is not in the Aramaic and not in most of the Greek text. I think you could leave it out and for a very good reason. I'm going to give you just the structure, the way it reads in Greek and then in Aramaic. In the Greek, uh, it's not in the teaching words of human wisdom. That word teacheth really modifies the word words. It's the teaching words of human wisdom. It's the word didactos. We get didactic from it, which is the art of teaching. Didactics are the art, is the art of teaching. It's the, the teaching words of human wisdom. But in the teaching, then leave a little blank, of spirit. That's literally the way the Greek reads. The teaching of spirit. But leave that little blank in there. Because there's an ellipsis. Because this parallels that first phrase. In the first phrase it was teaching words of human wisdom. Here it's teaching what? Words of spirit. What? Wisdom. See it? An ellipsis. The teaching words, the didactic words of human wisdom, but in the didactic words of spirit wisdom. But the Aramaic is even better. It also has an ellipsis. Not in the teaching of words of wisdom of men.
Got that? Not in the teaching of words of wisdom of men, but in the teaching, blank, of spirit. What's the ellipsis in Aramaic? Of word of wisdom. The reason I go singular is because of a word of wisdom. One word at a time, you know. It's not the whole wisdom of God, but a word of wisdom at, at a time. Not the teaching of words of wisdom of men, but in the teaching of a word of wisdom of spirit. Again, this section parallels 12, 13, 14. So verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the didactic or teaching words of wisdom of men, but the teaching word of wisdom of the Spirit. And then you have that word spirit, but you also have the word spiritual things and spiritual. Three times a form of the word spirit comes up in that verse, and that is another figure of speech. Ellipsis was the first one. This is another one called paragmenon, P-A-R-E-G-M-E-N-O-N, -E -E where words that come from the same root are repeated. You have spirit, spiritual things, and spiritual. Three different words, but all from the same root. So it really draws attention to what? Spirit. <laughs> spiritual things. And this word spiritual is a key word in Corinthians. The word spiritual, the first one, spiritual things, refers to spiritual matters or things of the spirit, the mystery. Spiritual things of the mystery. The second word spiritual is the means by which we compare it, and that is the words. When we speak, we compare spiritual matters by spiritual means, which is by means of words which have been taught to us by the Spirit, the Word of God. We don't compare ourselves to each other as they did in 2 Corinthians 10, 12 to 18, where it says they compare themselves one with another. We don't do that. You compare yourself with the Spirit if you want to compare yourself to something. We compare spiritual things of the mystery with spiritual words. This verse 13, Dr. Werwell translated, which things of the mystery we speak also, not with words taught by man's wisdom, but with those words taught by the Spirit. Isn't that terrific? Not the words taught by man's wisdom, but those words taught by the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Comparing or explaining spiritual matters, that is, the mysteries from the Spirit, the things regarding the mystery, the spiritual matters, mysteries from the Spirit, by spiritual words, words from the Spirit. Verse 14. For the natural man, the man of body and soul, doesn't even decomai. He receives not the things of the mystery of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know those spiritual things, <clears throat> because they are spiritually discerned and this word discerned is to examine by investigation hey the spirit searches like a dog tracks him down remember 
all things of the mystery, even the deep things. You can dig down and really get into it. What's that song? Dig dig a little deeper in the well. Well, with the spirit, you can dig a lot deeper. The deep things, search it, track it down. Here, these things of the spirit, of the mystery, they are spiritually examined by investigation, not by man, but by the spirit, because with the spirit you can search all things of the mystery. Dr. Werwell's translation is, and the natural man of body and soul receives spiritually not the things of the mystery from the spirit. For they, the things of the mystery, are foolishness unto him, and he cannot know the things of the mystery by experience. Gnosko. Because, or reason being, they, the things of the spirit, are spiritually, by the words, examined by investigation. In other words, by the words of the word that are revealed, the all truth, you can examine by investigation the things of the mystery. But otherwise you cannot. Verse 15, he that is spiritual examines by investigation. It's the same word. All things. All things. What things? Of the mystery. Yet he himself is examined by investigation of every anti-cult leader there is. Every Judean. Every uh, Apollo follower, Gnostic. <laughs> no, Sophist. No, he's, he is examined by investigation by no man. He that is spiritual examines by investigation all things of the mystery. And Dr. Werwell's translation is, and the spiritual one, the man of body, soul, and spirit, examines by investigation all things of the mystery. Nevertheless, he himself spiritually is examined by investigation by no one. No natural man can do it. So you're in good shape. Verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. Here we, again we have a quotation, a gnome, G-N-O-M-E. It's quoted from Isaiah 40, 13. And in that section you can read the context sometime. It talks about all the great things that God has done that no man can really outdo God. And no man can really comprehend the greatness of what God has done. And so you could never make known the fullness of what God has done in the Old Testament. However, this word instruct that's used here is not the word teach, didasko, that's normally used. It's a Greek word, sumbibadzo, S-U-M-B-I-B-A-Z, long O, sumbibadzo. It's the word that's translated knit together in Colossians. Knit together in love. It's the word translated compacted by that which every joint supplies in Ephesians 4.16. It's the word translated proving that this is very Christ in Acts 9.22. This word is not that you could instruct God, but that you could Teach him, prove him, to, to uh, instruct in an authoritative way the things of God to somebody else. Not trying to instruct God, that's stupidity. But you can't even teach him when you're just a natural man. In the Old Testament, they couldn't teach him to anybody else. They could not represent God, be 
a counselor for God. Who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may teach him, prove him, to unite in opinion him to somebody else. But we can. We have the what? That's the answer to, I have not seen nor ear heard neither the enter the heart of man the things of the mystery which God hath prepared for them that love him. But we've got the Spirit and the Spirit can search, search all things. So now you can teach. You've got the mind of Christ. Wow! <laughs> but he couldn't tell the Corinthians about it. They were still babies. And he never tells them what it was. He only tells them how great it is. Right? He tells them all about the manifestation of it in 12, 13, 14, how it's to be used most efficaciously. He sure gets close to it when he talks about the one body, many members in one body, but he never tells them because they're not big enough to receive it. He's only spiritually wetting their appetite, getting them to that place. This, ver this phrase, we have the mind of Christ, is a strong statement showing that we have now that which was not available in the Old Testament. And this verse is the crown of this whole section which covers the spiritual things of the mystery. Natural wisdom was annihilated in chapter 1 and the wisdom of God was established. But it was the wisdom regarding Christ crucified and everything that that accomplished, which was pretty good. But there's another aspect, another phase, another dimension to that wisdom of God, the hidden wisdom regarding the mystery. And chapter 2 answers the question that would be posed by man, why could we not know God by our wisdom? In chapter 1, Paul says, you could not know because the knowledge used to be a mystery. And secondly, you do not have the Spirit of God. Or, if you have it, you're not walking there yet, and that's why you haven't been able to receive it. You're not the mature, fully initiated in order to really comprehend the greatness of it. And the literal, according to usage of this verse, for reason being, who knew by experience the Lord's entire mind so that he could teach it? That he could teach it. Who knew it? Nevertheless, we have the Lord's entire mind so we can teach it. Now that's wisdom par excellence. Father, we thank you for this night and for sharing with us and allowing us to know your great wisdom. Not only Jesus Christ and him crucified that we are righteous, we're sanctified, redeemed, we have your wisdom, your power, your love, and all the other things you've done, but even the great knowledge of the mystery, which was hidden before the foundations of the world, and that we can stand this day fully knowledgeable of those things which you have revealed, and that we have the mind of Christ. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful night together and for the knowledge and wisdom of your word in our hearts and lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Bless you.